Hello, my name is Stephen Murray, and this is The Knoll, an online gathering place for the people of Oak Knoll Lutheran Church and a place to share our community's stories. I started my job here at Oak Knoll just as we were about to resume in-person worship during the pandemic. It was a time that saw incredible change for everyone, the results of which we will be discovering for many, many years. In this week's story, Linda Strand reflects on how the COVID pandemic was in many ways similar to her experiences with polio in her family during her youth. I went through a time of PTSD when COVID became a reality because in many ways, my experience with my twin brother Lyle having polio was surprisingly like what happened during COVID. Isolation, no visitors, fear, and altered routines were part of COVID and of polio. Many who have had polio are now dealing with what is called post-polio syndrome, a return of some of the original polio symptoms. Today, several current Oak Knoll members are living with painful post-polio syndrome side effects. August 18th. 1952. I was eight years old. It was a hot summer. Polio was on the rise. During this time, much like during the recent COVID pandemic, people were fearful of going anywhere where there might be crowds. There were so many unanswered questions about polio. How did one get polio? Why did some become paralyzed and some get only flu-like symptoms? My twin brother Lyle, age 8, had been admitted to the local hospital and diagnosed with polio. My world came crashing down, and I was afraid. I blamed myself for Lyle getting polio. I felt guilty because about five days before Lyle became ill, I had what the doctor determined was the flu. I ran a high fever and was nauseous and achy. After a doctor's visit and a couple days of rest, I recovered. When Lyle became ill, my dad and mom brought Lyle to the doctor. The doctor's first impression was that Lyle had the same illness from which I had recovered. However, on the way home to the farm, his condition deteriorated. As my dad drove into the garage, Lyle said he was having trouble breathing, so they backed out and went right back to the doctor. As I watched the car leave, I was terrified. What just happened? Lyle was diagnosed with polio. He would stay in the hospital overnight, and the doctor told my mom and dad they should drive Lyle to Sister Kenny first thing in the morning. Can you imagine driving 150 miles on the narrow Highway 55 in a 1950 Ford with Lyle lying in the back seat complaining of breathing problems? He told them he was feeling worse. He was becoming extremely weak. My mom was always honest. On the way to Sister Kenny, Lyle asked our mom, Am I going to die? No response. Then he asked again, am I going to die? Again, there was no response. Of course, what could she say? She didn't know. When they arrived at Sister Kenny, hospital personnel put Lyle in a gurney and wheeled him into the hospital where he was transferred to a bed and moved into a 30-bed boys' ward. No visitors were allowed, period. Throughout his stay at Sister Kenny, not even my mom and dad could see Lyle. This was a contagious disease. The hospital was so full, they couldn't possibly fit visitors into the wards. There was a total lack of communication. Cell phones and email didn't exist, and there were no telephones available in the rooms. The nurses and doctors didn't have time to contact parents. Lyle believed he had been abandoned. On top of that, while at Sister Kenny, Lyle didn't receive any mail, including the daily letters I struggled to write. Staff at Sister Kenny didn't have time to deliver mail, and there wasn't room for mail in the wards. He was certain that everyone had forgotten about him. 
Throughout this time, I remember praying repeatedly that Lyle would get well. Most of the information I heard about Lyle was from me listening to adults whisper about him. I was only eight years old, and back then, serious, scary information was not usually shared with children. However, my imagination was huge, and I was picturing the worst-case scenario. We didn't know how Lyle was doing. If he survived, what would he be like? There was so much uncertainty. I was worried that I would not be accepted by my friends when they learned that someone at our house had been diagnosed with polio. Having polio in your home was like a pariah. Even with an assurance that everyone in the family was okay and Lyle would be fine, many people chose to avoid being around anyone who had polio or had been near someone with polio. There was a sign at the end of our driveway, which to an eight-year-old looked huge. The sign said, Quarantined. Through the years, Lyle shared some of his memories from his time at Sister Kenny with my siblings and me. Several stories have made me feel sad for what he had to endure as an eight-year-old. When Lyle arrived at Sister Kenny, he had developed a complete loss of muscle control. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough staff to feed the patients. When he tried to feed himself, he spilled most of his food because he was so weak. Lyle remembers going to bed one night and finding that the boy that had been in a bed close to his in the ward was not there in the morning. He suspected that the boy had died, but there was no one to ask. The medical staff were working as hard as they could to save lives, At that time, they probably weren't thinking about the emotional support the kids needed. One day, Lyle met enough of the physical criteria to be transferred to Swedish Hospital. There to greet him were our mom and dad. What a glorious reunion. He realized he had not been abandoned by my parents after all. Waiting in his new room were all the letters that he hadn't received while at Sister Kenny. His friends and family had not forgotten him. After additional therapy, he was discharged. I was in Minneapolis staying with my aunt and uncle, so I was able to ride home with Lyle. I think we smiled the whole way home. In 1957, the Salk injectable vaccine began to be widely used. We happily lined up in the school gymnasium to get our shots. No questions were asked. The Sabin oral vaccine followed in 1960. What a relief to know that polio could be controlled. As I reflect on this time in my life, I realize now how my twin brother's polio impacted my faith. Even though I was only eight years old, my older siblings said I should pray, and pray I did. I felt comforted as I prayed, and perhaps less afraid. Throughout my life, I have felt wrapped in God's love when problems have arisen, and I believe in the power of prayer. The Knoll is a production of Oak Knoll Lutheran Church in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Pastor Jay Rudy, Senior Pastor. Music performed by Matt Sarar and produced by me, Stephen Murray. If you would like to learn more about Oak Knoll Lutheran Church, please visit us on the web at oklutheran.org or check out the live stream of our Sunday worship on YouTube every week at 9.30 Central. If you would like to share your story as part of the Knoll podcast, you can find information on how to get involved on our website. Thanks for listening, and God bless.